Hello, hello, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, joined as always by Nick Horwat and the Pittsburgh Penguins. They did lose on Sunday by a score of 2-1 to one in overtime to the New Jersey Devils at the Prudential Center. And Horwat, before we get into the game, before we get into Pedersen's too many men on the ice, before we get into everything we're going to talk about today, trade targets, all that fun jazz, I want to tell you that whenever I saw a final score of 2-1, to one, I watched the game obviously, but whenever you look back and you see that final score of 2-1 to one in a matinee game at the Prudential Center, you just shrug your shoulders and say, yeah, that sounds about right, don't you? Yeah, it's, and in, no less in overtime, it was uh, a perfect storm of, that's exactly how that game would play out. Mm-hmm. The Penguins and matinee games, struggle sometimes you know that it's it's not a friendly relationship uh the penguins in the prudential center uh historically have not gotten along and tack on the overtime loss and that just makes sense for 2022 23 um it was just exactly how you'd expect the game to turn out and i would also say that if you look at this game in a vacuum i'm gonna say this in a vacuum you go ah you know what we'll take the point because it's a tough team this year. Mm -hmm. We're playing at Prudential Center in the afternoon. We'll take the point and move on. But you have to expand this vacuum right now, because that is our eighth overtime loss of the season. And we're still trying to find a little bit more consistency in the win column. It's been hard this year. It's not um, exactly where everyone had hoped to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you you look at the overtime issues, which we'll talk about a little bit deeper in, in a few minutes here, but they kind of trouble you because this team should be good in overtime. Um, but before we get to that, there was an entire 60 minutes mm-hmm. of play for the Pittsburgh Penguins in which they looked very good against a very good team in the New Jersey Devils. They quite literally outplayed the Devils at five on five throughout the entirety of the game. And as we've been asking for for a long time, they got better as the game went along. You look at it, um, maybe not in the statistical category, but I thought that they overall, if you just, you know, eye test wise, they looked better in that game. 71% of the expected goals for at five on five in the second period, 60% in the third period against a team like the Devils, who really makes their mark at five on five. Like they're a great team on the power play, but their five on five is where they, the, you know, the butter is made for them. And they were not able to really stand up to the Pittsburgh Penguins in possession and expected goals, which is a good sign for the Pittsburgh Penguins moving forward. But you're just not able to capitalize on your chances. And I mean, the biggest one that stands out is two and a half minutes into the third period, Ryan Paling in his first game back from injury gets a great opportunity with Vitek Vanacek out of position and you clang it off the crossbar. Even Steve Mears on the broadcast said, he scored. Oh, he didn't score. So... Uh, it's, it's tough for the Pittsburgh Penguins to swallow that loss, especially when you should have had the two to one lead right there. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. I mean, Manichek made a great, great play to get back and that hurts. And sometimes that'll happen, but you still have to answer in a different way. Um, I don't remember the numbers off the top. I mean, how many power players opportunity, power play opportunities do we have? Because it seemed more than zero. Yeah, it was two. And then New Jersey only had one, which felt a little weird. I mean, that's it was a pretty well disciplined game, I guess you could say. I mean, oh, well, sorry. No, Devils had two. You got to remember they won on one. Oh, that's right. I was look, I think I checked after regulation for some reason. Yeah, they had uh, uh, Ricard Raquel for holding. Oh, that's right. Cause that's what ruined our first power play opportunity, mm-hmm. which, by the way, we they got to stop doing that. Yeah. Got to stop doing that. I get this power play is kind of eating it this season, but you're not making it easier on yourselves by ruining, uh, by ending your power plays early. Mm -hmm. No, it's sure. It was a well-disciplined game. Just looking at the box score here, looking at the hockey reference summary, the scoring summary, and the penalty summary, it looks like a very well-maintained New Jersey devils hockey game, Mm -hmm. you know, three goals in total had to go to overtime and there was four penalties between the two teams. Mm -hmm. And one of them was a bench penalty. It's uh, that, that's a struggle for the Penguins to play in that place, isn't it? 
Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that. I mean, even dating back to it started and it made sense when, you know, Marty Brodeur was there because that's the type of style they played because of them having Marty Brodeur. They played slow, plotting, low scoring. We're going to beat you two to one. We're going to beat you one to nothing because we have a Hall of Fame goaltender, potentially the best goaltender in the history of the game. That's an argument that we're not going to get into on this show, but that's the way they used to play it. But even when he left and they struggled to score, they struggled to do everything. They would keep these games close against the Pittsburgh Penguins, specifically at Prudential Center and specifically in matinee games on a Sunday, which for some reason stands out to me as like the only time the Pittsburgh Penguins play over there in New Jersey. But nonetheless, you mentioned that bench minor penalty. We got to get to it. Marcus Pedersen jumps on the ice probably just one second too early, goes down, scores what he thought was the game-winning goal, but not so fast as the Stripes say. You jumped on a bit too early for us. You're going to go to the box, and we all know how that ended. Dougie Hamilton, who was basically automatic against the Pittsburgh Penguins on the power play, ends the game, gives the Devils the win, and sends the Penguins home with only one point instead of the two that they thought they had gotten. For what? first and foremost, was that the right call by the referees? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's no one. I don't think anyone's really been questioning this questioning if this was the right or wrong call it's it's a little harder to uh have a too many men on the ice call be wrong mm-hmm. it's a little more difficult than you know say a high sticking or uh you know tripping holding whatever interference it's this one is a little more cut and dry you know it's mm-hmm. it was the reason why Sullivan was golf clapping the officiating crew in where was it Ottawa uh, in Ottawa um, because they got a too many men on the ice call. Correct. Because that's, again, you can't miss those. Sometimes like we over, we was it last season, Tim Peel, I believe it was, had his mic you know, leaked out of um, him pretty much saying that they're trying to look for an even up. Okay. So imagine an, a ref is looking for an even up, but that happens when well, you have to make that call because that's, that one's a bit more of an obvious one. Um, the blatant calls you're good. They're a hunt nine times out of 10, the right call. Mm-hmm. Sure. There might be some obscurities with it, but that's just, that comes with the game. Uh, but this one was pretty clear. This one was mm-hmm. pretty clear. Nothing we could do about it. And, you know, Pedersen took the blame. He took the fall. He did. Uh, Sullivan said it was the right call. There's nothing much we can do about it other than, you know, show a little more patience, I guess I get, you know, Patterson thought he had his first goal of the season, thought he won the game. That's you get it. You know, the, he's you're excited. It's it's not a you know, it's not like a firing offense or anything like that, or fireable offense. It is just a you got a little anxious, you stepped out a little early. Mm-hmm. Um it's an understandable play almost where it's mm-hmm. you go you don't you do have to be smarter, yeah, but you get it. Dude hasn't scored yet this year, he's probably itching for one, saw his chance. And was just a little too early. Let's say he is onside though. Let's say, or uh, let's say he waits that second that you said and pops out at the right time. Hey, we're having a bit of a different conversation because I don't know yeah, how much sure. that second changes. Uh, but tough, uh, tough play regardless. And yeah, you know you don't want to blame him, but he he'll blame himself, and it's just hard. Well, Not ideal. It- And here's the thing I I mentioned and you mentioned, and and you're correct, that that's an obvious call for the referees when it happens like that and it's as blatant like that. But let me not just say the fact that it's Pedersen jumped on the ice about a second too early, but not only that, a good job by the New Jersey Devils second guy back because he was hustling to get back in the play. If he would have just skated it slowly, they would not have called that because Pedersen wasn't technically in the play until he got the puck on his stick. But the problem was if he hadn't jumped out too early, they wouldn't have gotten the two on one because of the way that that trailing devil was coming back. If he was, if he was lagging it and he was out of the play and he wouldn't have been even close. If Pedersen would have waited, they wouldn't have called it. They would have said, all right, you know what? He wasn't going to be able to make the play. Even if Pedersen waited a second, two seconds, but because of the hustle by that New Jersey devil second guy back, that's what made it obvious. So I don't want to put it all on, on Pedersen. I want to give some credit. I don't know who it was. I got to look back and, and see, but whoever the second New Jersey devil back was, was the reason that penalty was called. It wasn't all on Pedersen. It was a good job by the devils to recognize, Hey, it looks like he's getting out on the ice faster. If I pick up the pace here, it's going to make it 
an obvious call. But if he would have lagged, I, I doubt they would have called that because they would have said you wouldn't have gotten into the play anyway. It would have been a two on one anyway. And Pedersen didn't get the puck until the other Pittsburgh Penguin was off the ice. So I do want to give him some credit. It's not all on him. And yes, he was getting anxious. He saw an opportunity to go out there and win a massive game for the Penguins. And it just cost him at the end. And, and you hate to see it for a player that's been as good as Pedersen for the Pittsburgh Penguins on Thursday. I gave him an A plus in our midseason grades. That was mm -hmm. the highest grade. I, I gave him a better grade than Crosby and Malkin. I mean, for, for different reasons, not for, for play on the ice, but he's having a great season. It's an unfortunate mistake. And, and I know that he's taking it on the chin, as you saw in the post game, but yeah. Let's talk about the issues in overtime as a whole, because as you mentioned, this is an overarching issue that is uh, really plaguing the Pittsburgh Penguins. 1-0 in the shootout, I will say that. At least they're undefeated in the shootout, 1-0 with the lone win being against the Calgary Flames. Uh, Evgeny Malkin putting it in the back of the net there. But 2-8 and eight in overtime, making a 3-8 and eight total in, time, in games that have gone past 60 minutes. Horwat, that's a massive issue but why do you think they struggle so much in that extra frame? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think we had, we just, we talked about this a lot last year and I think I fell back on, <clears throat> they play too boring. They play to, they play to watch the other team make the first mistake and try to attack, which a lot of teams do, but they're being too passive in it. It's like, they're, it's like watching their power play. They're not taking opportunities they're just kind of waiting for mistakes to be made and that's the wrong way of doing it especially in three on three um because let's be also let's be blatantly honest here Sidney Crosby's not good at face-offs right now in certain times overtime's one of them apparently he's only two and eight as well when it comes to uh face-offs in overtime so you're losing the puck right away not even it's not even like you're getting an opportunity to set yourself up for success and when you do you're waiting you have five minutes to make the play here. Mm -hmm. You have to take advantage of it and play a little more aggressive. And I've been saying this since the three on three overtime was introduced. You have the players to play aggressive, trust your back check and attack. Don't sit there and wait for the mistakes to be made because a, that makes for boring three on three. That's they brought this, this style in to promote offense and to promote some entertaining play and leave it to the Penguins and a couple other teams to just not do that and make it a strategic wait for the first mistake type of game, which is honestly so boring to watch that it hurts. And, and I'm also, and clearly, as we can see, it's turning out that you're the ones making the first mistake almost every time. Mm -hmm. y yeah, it, that's, I mean, the Pittsburgh Penguins, there's multiple reasons why they struggle in overtime. I don't think you can pinpoint one reason. I think that is one of them. Yeah, uh, losing I, possession right off the bat is, is difficult, especially you mentioned the Penguins play a boring style. They just like to hold possession and they be believe that if they have the possession long enough, something's going to open up. Someone on the other team is going to make that mistake. But like you said, the Penguins are the team that makes the mistake because they don't get possession early enough in overtime. I think there's, uh, you know, three other reasons that I could I could look at. And one of them is that your star players are already gassed by the time you get to overtime because of the reliance that they have in regulation on this, these guys. I, I have the stat in the story for this podcast, not necessarily my notes, but in the last 10 games, the Penguins, as you mentioned, are four, four and two. Their top six has scored 81 percent of their goals. You can't have that. Like, I understand that, yeah, sometimes it's going to be over 50%. Sometimes you're going to rely on those top six guys more. But these are the only guys scoring. Like, Ty Smith has a goal. Jeff Carter has one. Uh, Kasperi Kapanen has one. Mark Friedman has one. But the rest are, you know, Ricard Raquel has four. Gensel has five. Zucker has five. Crosby. But they all have multiple goals. The only top six guy in the last 10 games that doesn't have multiple goals is Brian Rust. So you're over relying on these guys in regulation. By the time you get to overtime, they're the only guys playing. They are already gassed. They can't go out there and stick with these other teams that have been rolling four lines through the entire game. Like the devils did to the Pittsburgh Penguins yesterday. I think the other two issues to me are they've made bad decisions, bad turnovers, take bad penalties. And yesterday, you know, I, 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 you know, Pedersen a second here, a second there. That's not a penalty. And that's a win. 
but it ends up being a penalty because you got over anxious. They've taken bad penalties in other overtimes this season as well. Uh, and I think also when it's three on three, the biggest issue that I see is their defensive spacing is horrendous. I mean, too many times do I see them lose a man in the defensive zone. Part of that is I don't think they always play man to man in three on three. They play a zone style to try to continue to keep these guys a little bit more fresh. But too many times do I see, hey, you know, the entire left side of the ice, there's one player over there and he's not wearing a Penguins uniform. And all they need to do is make that one pass. And it's a perfect opportunity against Tristan Jari. And I thought that he made a couple saves on Sunday afternoon where that game should have been over. Like if it wasn't for Tristan Jari, that game should have been over. And the Pittsburgh Penguins are lucky that Jari kept a minute in overtime as long as he did. But you can only do so much whenever you go down four on three. That's almost as we've seen since they went back to this style. That's almost a guaranteed goal. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you also have to look at the two wins that we have picked up in the overtime frame. Uh, not even the shootout one, just the two that we've picked up in the overtime frame. They came from a power play opportunity against Buffalo. Mm-hmm. Yep. And and the uh, trying to lose every game possible Anaheim Ducks. D- don't Listen, it was Trevor Zegers on a breakaway against Casey DeSmith. That's a guaranteed goal. He knew what he was doing. They're mm-hmm. trying to lose. He could have ended that game so quickly. He yeah. attempted to pass to Cam Fowler. He had that not happened, we'd be having a much different discussion about the power play again, and we probably would have had, or power play overtime. And we probably would have had it sooner because we would have lost in overtime to the Ducks. Yeah, I would have been way more upset about that game. I heard he was, but had it not been for that, we wouldn't have had that win there because, like I said, Trevor Zegers immediately would have won that game for them. Mm-hmm. Casey Smith pretty much said as much. I mean, he said, yeah, he's the shootout guy. I don't, I wasn't expecting it and neither was he said uh, someone else, but it was Camp Fowler. Wasn't expecting him to pass it either. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's good that Smith was ready for the shot, but I mean, come on, you're not stopping him. Especially the way Smith has been playing this season. But those are your two wins. Those are your two overtime wins <clears throat> against a Buffalo Sabres team on the power play. Not good. And a, like I said, against an Anaheim Ducks team trying to lose where you got lucky that Trevor Zegers made the first air quotes mistake mm-hmm. in that overtime. So you can't make the mistakes and they're doing a lot of it and they're losing possession early. Yeah, all of these things are culminating into the same reasons of you just got to be better. You're leaving so many points on the table. I mean, imagine what it's, eight overtime losses. Let's say we pick up four of those. We're suddenly, oh, look at that. Not in a wild card spot. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's tough. Yeah, it, it is tough. And, and I think also for the story, check it out on Inside the Penguins after this podcast drops. It also mentions losses in one score games because the Pittsburgh Penguins have been horrendous just in general in games separated by one goal. If they win half of them, which is half in regulation and take back half of their overtimes. Not only are they in third place, but they're four points off of first place in Carolina. So they have to be better in one goal games in general, uh, let alone once they get to that extra frame, because a lot of the times those can be the difference between playing a really good Carolina Hurricanes or Boston Bruins team in the first round and maybe matching up against the New Jersey Devils team where you have a little bit of a better chance uh, to push that to seven games and potentially move into the second round of the postseason. But uh, regardless, they just need to get better in that extra frame. The, the first 60 minutes of that game against the Devils, very entertaining, very good play. I mean, to me, entertaining. Some people don't like it. They think it's boring hockey, but I thought the Penguins were controlling the pace of play. I thought the Penguins were controlling the New Jersey Devils, and I liked what I saw from the Pittsburgh Penguins in there. They just need to start finishing. In regulation and overtime, they need to start finishing all their chances, especially if you're the bottom six because you're not creating enough to have that low of a shooting percentage and that low of a conversion rate. But we're going to take a quick break. When we return, the Penguins have gotten some reinforcements back from the injury list. we got a couple more that could be coming back this week. We'll talk about all of that and more on the tip of the iceberg.
Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. I'm Nick Berlansky, that's Nick Horwat, and the Pittsburgh Penguins, as they often are, have been dealing with injuries a lot since the middle of December. They were healthy for, what, that was a stretch of six games, the longest since like 2001 or something like that. Ridiculous stat nonetheless, but after that, obviously, plenty of injuries to be dealing with for the Pittsburgh Penguins, but right now they're on the other end of some of them. Uh, Ryan Paling returned on Sunday for his first game back. Nine minutes and 12 seconds of action, three shots on goal, one hit, and of course we mentioned it. Uh, missed an easy goal by shooting it off the crossbar with Vitek Vanacek down and out. Uh, it seems as if Mike Sullivan has a little bit more trust in Ryan Paling than he did in Jonathan Gruden, and it's not because Jonathan Gruden is young. In my opinion, that is because Mike Sullivan is loyal to the guys that gain his trust to a fault. And uh, that's more of an issue with other players than it is with Paling. But I wrote about that as well on uh, Inside the Penguins. So make sure you check that out. Uh, but Paling, good to get him back on the fourth line. I think that does boost it a little bit in the bottom six. Jeff Petrie, Horwat, returned on Friday, has picked up an assist in both games since coming back from injury. More importantly, has eight shots on goal in two games, four in each outing. And he gives you an actual number one defenseman. What have you thought about the return of Jeff Petrie and how important is he in this lineup now that he's come back? It's massively important. It's He takes over as the top power play unit defenseman. And I think that's sort of the biggest uh, part of his return here is that he's able to bring his shot first mentality to the power play. I mean, it was felt immediately in his first game. He um, took a shot on goal that bounced one way and then got to uh, whoever scored. It's escaping me now. Uh, Ricardo Raquel. Mm -hmm. And he picked up a secondary assist and it, it's all stemming from his you know, shot first mentality with the man advantage and bringing offense to a power play unit that quite frankly needed all the help it could get. Ty Smith was fine. He did okay. Uh, but, you know, he loved that drop pass, that drop pass that Jesse Marshall put a phenomenal story out on that go read that stuff it's it's better to have jeff petrie in there like i said as, as good as T ty smith may have looked he's not the ideal player for the situation as, and given the situation he was in he, he was thrust right into it immediately he didn't have time to sort of grow into it it was here's your one practice we're gonna help you scratch you for a game to get in another practice and here you go have fun you're playing top line minutes you're playing in the first power play units Become Chris Letang for us. No, it's just not going to happen to the 22-year-old. And he's been healthy scratch since. But, I mean, Jeff Petrie coming back in and assuming his position again. Um, we would have questioned Jeff Petrie on this team a couple of years ago, but I think things have changed. Uh, he's a much different player, I, that I believe, that uh, helps this team way more than he hurts it. And it's good to have that analytically perfect line almost of him and Pedersen put together mm -hmm. again. Yeah, the biggest thing with Jeff Petrie, whenever he went down with an injury, we said is, you know, Jeff Petrie being here and be playing the way that he had, especially with Marcus Pedersen, which is great to see those two back on the ice together again. The biggest thing was it's allowing Chris Letang to not have to play 27 minutes a night. Yeah. And when he went down, we said, man, this is going to be a lot of work for Chris Letang again. And that's not what you want. And then, of course, Chris Letang goes down and you're looking around saying, well, uh, we don't know what to do now, uh, now that both guys are out. But Getting Jeff Petrie back is huge. You can just tell uh, by the command that he has with the puck and the command that he has on the ice how much of a next level he is at. And there's a reason he's the highest paid defenseman on the Pittsburgh Penguins, not to say that he's better than Chris Letang, but you allow that much money for a slot like that because you can trust him to be that number one guy. He has the pedigree of a number one guy. He was that last season for the Montreal Canadiens when Shea Weber went down and has yet to return. Uh, but he brings a level that none of these other guys, especially on the right side, can really touch except for Chris Letang. And you can tell that that was sorely missed. And getting him and Jari, who we'll talk about in a second, back at the same time just exponentially increases the odds of having good defensive hockey and keeping the other team below three goals a game, which they were able to do the last two games. I think Petrie and Pedersen is a phenomenal pairing. I think Mike Sullivan would be an idiot to separate them, which he hasn't yet. Uh, so cheers to him for that. And uh, really, I think the biggest thing you mentioned on the power play is 
Jeff Petrie has that veteran swagger that says, you know what? I don't want to make the drop pass because I know better right now in this situation. I'm not going to just do what I'm told because I have the leash to be able to make a mistake. Whereas Ty Smith, you make a mistake. We saw it so many times with younger players who haven't gained Sullivan's trust yet. You make that mistake, you might not get another chance. I mean, look at you, so Ricola, who's over in Europe again because he made, what, probably one mistake every game, and that was enough for, for Mike Sullivan to say, yeah, not on my team, sorry. Um, so Petrie has the leash to be able to say, hey, you can trust me. I've been in this position a long time. I'm going to go out there. I might make a mistake, but nine times out of ten, this season at least, Jeff Petrie making the right call. And it has added to the power play. Whereas Ty Smith probably went out there and said, I'm going to do exactly what you tell me to do every single time uh, because I want to earn a spot on this team and going off on my own and then making the mistake. That's a great way to get sent back to the Wilkes bear. Yeah. And it's not to say Ty Smith has been bad, by the way, he's no, played he the best defenseman in nine games that he yeah, played. He's, he played very well. He seemed to get a lot out of Brian Dumoulin somehow. But I mean, we saw that before already with Brian Dublin this season. The fact that, that was only going to last so long. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not to say Ty Smith has been bad at all. He's been pretty good. We know we have something fun for uh, maybe down the line. You know, I don't. I mean, he's already getting healthy, scratched again. I don't expect him to. I don't either. Play too much more. He'll probably be back to Wilkes-Barre before the week is out. So, um, yeah. Not to say Ty Smith's been bad. He's been. He was solid. I mean, he he did help that power play. In certain areas. I mean, there was definitely a sense of uh, mobility because that's one thing Ty Smith does have over Jeff Petrie is that he's able to move a little bit more. You know, mm-hmm. Jeff Petrie's more of a Mack truck than he is a, uh, a sports car. I don't know. It's He doesn't move the same way, but um, regardless, once you're in, once you're in the zone, Jeff Petrie's there to give you that shot first mentality and get pucks in. That's really, it boils down to the basics, but that's what we've been trying to preach for this power play all season. Get back to the basics, get everything on net, and create your own opportunities. That's what Jeff Petrie does. Yeah, I've enjoyed watching him the past two games. I don't know if it's because of the absence for the longest time of a really top-tier right-handed defenseman on in the roster. Uh, but, you know, it was nice seeing Jeff Petrie get out there and nice seeing that stabilization of the blue line once he returned. Especially, I mean, him and Pedersen, I don't know what it is about that duo, but... They are, you know, one of the most underrated and probably one of the best still analytically paired up defensemen when they are together on the ice at five on five. Just a phenomenal thing for the Penguins to have, especially if, I mean, I don't know if I'd go as far as to say it, you know, maybe that should be the top pairing even when Latang comes back uh, de- deployment wise. I mean, you can always, you know, in the little graphic, you can always put out, hey, Chris Latang, first pairing defenseman. But deployment wise, it should be even if not leaning towards petrie and Pedersen, at least when Latang initially returns yeah it's it's an interesting definitely those two should stay together the idea of putting them as the top unit on paper um is another fun little concept i think i think the defense for the most part for the penguins defense needs to start playing a little more like those numbers don't mean much we're just kind of putting out whatever unit we feel is going to perform mm-hmm. um rather than setting it in stone of, hey, Crystal Tang and whoever are the number one guys. They're going to log the minutes. Petrie Patterson, number two. They're going to log this, this amount of minutes. And third, you're getting about 10. Um, yeah, they need to be a little more free with that. And Mike Sullivan said that Petrie is a guy that is a lot like Latang. He can eat those minutes up. He can take those minutes and play with an offensive mindset if he really needs to. So, mm-hmm. I'd like to see him get a few more minutes and cut back on the tang because we got the tang for six more years. And so far the injuries are piling up everybody. Let's cut his minutes down even just by a couple seconds this year. Let's just mm-hmm. get that ball rolling. Well, I wouldn't say the injuries are piling up, but obviously he's missed. A, a uh, he's had some games. Hard, yeah. Hard yeah it, it's been a month and everybody knows what we're yeah. talking about. So we don't need to get into that. Obviously, you know, something that I can't imagine, you know, a two month span having to deal with. So yeah. Crystal Tang's a warrior for even, you know, still coming back and still playing as many games as he has. So uh, we are, are excited to hopefully see him back on the ice this week. He has been practicing with the team, uh, not yet in a full contact capacity, despite having a full contact Jersey on at the last practice. Uh, but let's talk about Tristan Jari really quickly, because a lot of people are saying, and they're correct in saying that 
probably the most important piece for the Pittsburgh Penguins, considering blue line and net, especially considering what uh, Casey DeSmith was showing as a starter for his little two-week sample size. But Tristan Jari returns to the Pittsburgh Penguins, has made 67 saves on 70 shots since returning. That's a 957 save percentage, including 44 saves in the win against the Ottawa Senators on Friday. He held two good offenses in Ottawa and New Jersey to one and two goals, respectively. You know, Horwat, I gave him a poor grade last week uh, because of the injuries, because of not being able to stay in the lineup. And I, I do still believe in that because, you know, three injuries in the past calendar year speaks for itself, two of them where he's missed significant time. But he has come back and not really missed a beat. He's kind of showing that all-star swagger that he has had several times in his career. How much of a psychopath is this guy? He said he liked seeing a lot of shots in his first game back to get back into the rhythm. I mean, to each is their own, but taking on a season-high amount of shots, almost a career-high amount of shots in your first game back sounds a little intimidating, but no, he handled it with ease and um, is looking damn good. Giving up two goals to a pretty fiery Devils team. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, it was in a loss, but... I mean, you held your own through the first 60. One thing that Tristan Jari has done stupidly well this year in, because it isn't a thing that should happen, but it is, and he holds it down anyway, giving up goals in the first minute and letting that be the only goal he gives up. Yeah. That's impressive. The fact that, think about it, it would have happened again had Paley knocked that knocked in that empty net, or empty net, knocked in that goal with pretty much the empty net. Yeah, basically. Had, yeah. Had any of those other shots maybe just found their way through Vanacek, or even if, Pedersen was on side or uh, on the right end of the too many men call. Suddenly we're having that, that discussion as well of Tristan Jari is good at holding down uh, the fort of after giving up a goal in the opening minute, he does it too often. That's for damn sure. But yeah. um, he buckles in, he's able to lock it down and say, all right, that's it. That's enough of that. Didn't mean to do that. Um, he's a really good goalie this year. I forget who said it may have been Cody on our website, top five goalie in this league, truly. And he can be if he's, you know, staying this consistent, staying healthy. He looks good when he's in there. Yeah. His downs when he's playing this year have been not too long. I mean, obviously the losing streak back in early November speaks for itself, but you know, the overwhelming majority of his actual playing time when he's healthy has been positive this season, but those injuries are my only reservation with him, especially in a year where, hey, you're going to have to evaluate every angle of this player and determine whether or not he is the goaltender of the future for your team because his contract's up. You have to determine how much money you're willing to pay this guy, and if he's going to be out significant time in back-to-back -back years, and, and the most important thing is, you know, he's healthy now. Can he be healthy for late in the season into the playoffs if the Penguins are able to make it? That's going to be the big determining factor. But right now, I do have a reservation because three injuries in the past calendar year, two of them, significant time, one of them in the most important time of the season. So it's good that he's back. It's great that he's performing the way he has. I like Tristan Jari, don't get me wrong, but I am a little bit worried about the injuries, especially because he's playing behind a team that doesn't quite protect them as much as other teams do in the National Hockey League for their star goalies. They don't keep guys out of the crease just because they don't have the horses on the blue line to be able to do that. Petrie being back will help. I think Dumoulin has done a better job of that this season. When Ruda comes back, that helps as well. But P.O. Joseph, Chris Letang, Marcus Pedersen, these guys aren't hard-nosed black and blue defensemen that are going to keep guys out of the crease. And people on other teams know it. So Jari's going to face some contact. If he can't stay healthy, that's going to be a huge determining factor in whether or not the Penguins bring him back and how much they bring him back for. And I agree with that. Like, if he's going to be out in important times and important situations, then what is the point? Yeah, but yeah, it's totally fair. I, you do want to have faith in your guy, and you have to show that you have faith in your guy, too. So we'll have to see, I think. There's plenty of season. There's enough season left for him to make his statements. Yes. And he has enough time to. He's got plenty of games here coming up to prove to be something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, don't know. I think he's going to be able to pull something out here. Yeah. I mean, the only positive is, that, hey, maybe the yearly injury is done. Maybe that means he's going to be healthy the rest of the year. And if that's the case, it's a good thing for the Pittsburgh Penguins. They need him, certainly, uh, to p play at the level that he's playing right now, which... 
is probably hard to, to withstand. You know, 957 is a ridiculous save percentage. But if he's playing at somewhat the level that he's playing right now, the Pittsburgh Penguins are much better off. Um, and he's he's been tremendous since coming back in the lineup. But we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to start to talk a little bit about the trade deadline here. Rental or term, we're going to ask that question. And what position should the Pittsburgh Penguins target if they can only target one, our weekly pens full? We'll get to those both after this quick break. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast. Horwat, the trade deadline is on March 3rd of 2023 this year. So just about five or six weeks out from that right now. Of course, we've talked about Ron Hextall sitting on his hands, the need for the Pittsburgh Penguins to make a move. And we obviously have some names in mind, but this is not going to be that type of segment. What we're going to do in this trade target segment is talk about around what the Penguins need and what type of player they should be targeting. And then we'll let you give us some answers. Who do you think fits that mold? Who do you think would be a good player for the Pittsburgh Penguins? You can let us know by messaging us or by tagging us on Twitter at Iceberg Podcast or on Instagram at Tip of the Iceberg Podcast. Let us know what player you think they should target. But we're going to talk about the type of player. And first, I want to ask you before we get to our Pens poll, do you think the Penguins should target a rental who's on the last year of their contract, expiring at the end of the season, or should they get somebody with a little bit more term? It's It could go either way. I'd say if it's a bottom six guy, you go for the rental. Hmm. Because, I mean, the bottom six are people you can file in and out pretty easily. Although they end up being the most overpaid contract, so finding um, someone priced out in the, in the free agency is possible. In the same vein, we need to put some faith into our youth and actually utilize them a little bit more. So I'd say if it's the bottom six, you go for the rental. If it's a top six guy, though, you manage to get a top six guy, top line defenseman, feel free to re-sign him. I mean, that might force Jason Zucker out, and you don't want to see that, but um, sometimes you just need to do the small things to switch your team around. Uh, And that would be my thought of it. If it's a top six player, top line defenseman, uh, yeah, hopefully you can get him to stay afterwards Mm -hmm. if it is a bottom six forward yeah you're not going to move for a depth defenseman even a backup you're not going to move for a backup goalie either if it's a bottom six forward blood it can be a rental perfectly fine that's but it also depends on the player because i'm gonna hold on to my ryan o'reilly thing for just a moment here Mm -hmm. because he would play third line center and that is bottom six but he's a guy you would attempt to resign just because of the namesake so i guess it does depend on the name also but that, that'd be my thought process. Top six, you're going to re-sign him. Bottom, you, let walk. Did you just say you're going to re-sign Ryan O'Reilly for the namesake? Because he's that's a bottom... What do, that's what they do with Jeff Carter. No, that's why we're in this position. Now, no, you're not saying, hey, you know, sign him to an Alcatraz of a contract yeah. that can't be moved. But that's exactly what they did with Jeff Carter. Hey, you know, he's a big name. Bottom six performed well for us in a rental capacity, maybe two more years of this. And now you're looking at it and you're saying, why do we have the fifth oldest player in the national hockey league on a no move clause for the next year and a half? So I, I, I don't, I don't sign anybody because of that. That's, that was a red flag, Horwat red flag word. I was going to say the difference is Ryan O'Reilly is a proven, not proven. Okay. Hold on. Obviously he's proven. Obviously Jeff Carter was proven as well. Ryan O'Reilly has got some years ahead of him still. Okay. Ryan yes. O'Reilly is definitely a better player. I think that was more of what, our, okay. what I was going for is yes. we know we're going to have, if we were to re-sign Ryan O'Reilly, if we were to trade for Ryan O'Reilly and re-sign him, we know we're going to have a bit more production out of him, not only in the as an offensive threat, but also shutting down defenders. He's in the Selkie conversation every year. That's yeah. part of why I went, yeah, you can lose Teddy Bluger for him as well, yeah. easily, because he's going to bring – the same amount of defense, get more notoriety for it, and also have an offensive output. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just saying, you gave me a cardiac episode saying, we're going to sign him because of namesake. I was like, what are we doing? Yeah, namesake Uh, was the wrong word. I think it's because he performs as a top six forward, but he wouldn't be in the top six on our team. (laughs) Yeah, 
like Phil Kessel was, but to a lesser degree. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I'm just saying, you know, hearts pounded a little bit over on this side of the screen <laughs> when I heard that. But uh, no, to, to get back to the original question, rental or term, I would I would prefer a rental, to be completely honest, for multiple reasons. And, and I agree with you. If they can acquire a near perfect piece to go in that top six, then yes, do it. But that doesn't happen very often, and it's less likely to happen this year yeah. based on what the current market looks like. Ricard Raquel last season is an example. That's a near-perfect piece that has meshed well, fit well, and you signed him to a longer term, but that was a rental at the time. Yeah, It was a rental. It was expected to be a rental, especially when it was him and Brian Russ. Nobody expected both of those guys to be able to return on contracts this year. Decent job by, uh, by Ron Hextall there. Give him his flowers, but I don't see that deal out there for the Penguins. So get a rental for other reasons that are more important. Because as of right now, $20.5 million are going to fall off the end of the books at the end of the season. Now, with that comes some important pieces that you might want to resign. But the big names to consider, to me, Jason Zucker and mm-hmm. Jari, they mm-hmm. should make up more than half of that. And you need as much space as you possibly can to just kind of reform this team and also be active in free agency next summer. Because we cannot sit here today and expect Ron Hextall to fix all the issues in the bottom six. That is an off-season dilemma that they're going to need to do. And if they go out and they get a piece and he has term and it doesn't work out, you're just painting yourself into more of a corner. So to me, the answer is a rental. Somebody on an expiring contract is who I'm looking for. And less, like I said, near perfect piece like Ricard Raquel. So I, I think we're both on the same page. Get a rental unless you can get somebody that's ridiculous. I mean, you yeah. like Ryan O'Reilly. I like Max Domi, who's on a uh, on an expiring deal who could slot into that spot. And I know we said we weren't going to get into names, but I think it's safe to say that is the top name on each of our lists. You have Ryan O'Reilly. I have Max Domi. Yeah, and... It's impossible to have trade discussion and not bring up names. Let's just be fair. It's tr- yeah, it's it's tricky. Um, because let's also not like you're saying unless the perfect name comes along. Absolutely, yeah. Let's say we somehow land either Bo Horvat or who's the other one out of Vancouver because that's a dog show right now. Garland, Connor Garland, uh, Garland. Wait, Connor Garland. Yeah, that's who I was thinking. He's always on the trade block. It's it's Horvat. It, it's you know Besser. I'm thinking of Brock Besser. Oh, you're thinking of Brock Besser. I was like, they're all on the trade block. Yeah, I'm thinking of Horvat Besser, and then Timo Meyer squeezes into this conversation. Unless you land someone like that, yeah, absolutely, we're not. We're it should be a rental. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I think you're gonna have to pay too much for those guys anyway. I mean. What Jim Rutherford's doing in Vancouver is horrendous um, to me. Like seeing what he's doing there, you oh. know, not that not that we're getting much better work from Ron Hextall here, but the way that they treated Boost Boudreaux, I know this isn't a Canucks podcast, but that was Ugh. that was a masterclass at poor management. I mean, we give Vegas crap. That was way worse than anything Vegas has done. You know, yeah. just kind of stringing this guy along, making him answer questions about a job that he's clearly not going to have. Uh, and making him just basically sit there and be tortured. So that's horrendous. Uh, with that being said, a lot of Penguins connections there. Alvin cool. Rutherford were already there. Now it's Talkit as the interim coach. Uh, Sergei Gonchar is going to be behind the bench there. So, uh, yeah, Pittsburgh West is certainly uh, a shit show as well. But uh, let's get to our weekly Pens poll, Horwat. If the Penguins can only get one player at the trade deadline, which might be possible and might be what ends up happening because of the market, which position should they target? Uh, the overwhelming majority say third line center, which we've both mentioned two, three third line centers that we believe would fit very well with this team. 66% of you agreed as well. 21% said, yeah, get that top left-handed defenseman. That, that little, that little nugget that I dropped in last week, 21% people agree right now. The top name on that market, Jacob Chikrin of the Arizona Coyotes, 21% say top left-handed defenseman. And then also 13%, said go out there and get a third line winger. Uh I to me it's it's a third line somebody yeah. need, needs to happen. And that is what 79% of this vote. So yes, third line somebody. Uh center would be preferable, anybody would be helpful. Mhm. Yeah, third line anybody. 
<clears throat> third line center would be fun. Fourth, even the bottom, even go to the fourth line if you need to bump someone around. But I'm I'm here for a bottom six forward. Period. Mm-hmm. If it's a small guy, like I said, keep it as a rental. So be it. Bottom six. A couple friends of the show also gave a little bit of different answers. Allie basically said the same exact thing that we said. Would like a top six winger, but she said to push Rust down in the lineup, preferably to the third line. What do you think about Brian Rust in that spot? Do you think he deserves to be benched or not benched, sent down to the bottom six? Or do you think, hey, he's just six of six right now on that top six and and he's still performing at a decent level? I totally get where an answer like that is coming from, though. I Mm -hmm. think I don't think it'd be a bad idea because we know he's still going to get his power play minutes. He's still going to get his penalty kill minutes. Um, And putting him to the third line, you know, it doesn't necessarily wake up his scoring, but it becomes a threat down there, which is something we desperately need anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, having a nice little scoring threat in the bottom six sounds nice. I mean, hell, it's what won us two cups. It's it's exactly why this idea works. It's it's why you're thinking poking Brian Russ down to third line next to he's on the right side. Next to maybe you put Jeff Carter back at center Ooh. and McGinn and McGinn. Yeah. It's a lot of speed around Carter. Um, yeah. But McGinn and Rust could be a great duo. You never know. Yeah. It's a quite interesting concept. I don't totally hate it. I think it's a, it's a big brain move, mm-hmm. but again, that would probably also come along with someone who plays in the top six, i.e. this Timo Meyer or Brock Besser or Bo Horvat idea. Although Bo Horvat's a center, correct? Uh, yes, Bo Horvat does play center. Oh, well, you know, still gaining a top six forward suddenly that opens up that option and you build from there. Mm-hmm. The only thing I would caution Ali on is it has to, like we said, it has to fit. Like they yeah. have to come in and they have to fit. We've we've looked back at the first round picks the Pittsburgh Penguins have traded away. And that's probably what you're looking to do if you end up bringing in a top six forward. For sure. You know, go go back around it. Uh, Ryan Reeves. For a first round pick, Derek Broussard <laughs> for a first round pick, Kasperi Kapanen for a first round pick. It has to work well or it's not going to look good in the long run. So it has to be the perfect piece. I don't know if that piece is out there. I don't know who that is. Uh, I think Max Domi's a great piece. He's not the perfect piece. He's not sure. the piece to trade a first round pick for. He's not. It's just, he just isn't. He's your third line center if you acquire him. So um, I'd like to see that too, Allie. Uh, I would too. Um, one other response that came in through that pens poll which i like uh, i like putting it up later in the week because we get more updated answers i should probably start doing that uh, <laughs> our good buddy jeff taylor from the fly penguins fly game day podcast said i'd love a backup goaltender uh n- he knows it it's not something that's probably going to happen but he would love somebody else to uh kind of put a buffer between tristan jari and casey de smith yeah that's that one that, that's one that probably won't happen but it, it, i totally agree um I didn't want Casey DeSmith re-signed in the first place this season. I wanted somebody new, somebody fresh, and now clearly I look to be correct again. But that being said, uh, also, I don't, I wouldn't say Dustin Tokarski is that much of an answer either. No. So They're both better than uh, Louis DeBing, I will say. But. Well, yes, I think. Yeah, I think Louis DeBing, we just happened to catch the worst of the Rangers. Yeah, well. And a bunch of other aspects. That being said. Let's not have nightmares, guys. I think, <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with we could use a new backup goalie, but at the same sense, we could have used a new backup goalie to start the season. So stuck in that mud, nothing we could do there. I mean, he's here for what, another season after this? Maybe that's an off-season idea. Yeah. I yeah, like maybe, the idea. I do absolutely want a different backup. Maybe you trade him. I don't know. I don't know how this management feels about buying players out. We know there was only ever one player bought out under the Mario Lemieux era which was Jack Johnson, which we're still paying $2 million this year for. Hey. Um, but hey, that goes down to $900,000 after the season. So I don't know. Uh, I don't I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if you just bury Casey DeSmith's contract next year or if I mean, you can't really afford to go out there and sign another backup goaltender for over a million dollars. But maybe you go trade to tr- try to trade for James Reimer. I don't even know where he's at at this point. Uh, I believe he's in I believe he's in San Jose. I think so. He was last time I checked, but, you know, I don't pay too much attention to the San Jose Sharks. I'll pay more attention this week 
because the Pittsburgh Penguins play the Sharks two times in the next couple of weeks. We'll have to keep an eye on the Sharks. We'll have to keep an eye on the Caps, keep an eye on the Panthers, because those are the next three opponents for the Pittsburgh Penguins leading up to the All-Star break. Horwat, how important is it, last question, for them to get all three of these victories against these three teams that they should, theoretically, be in all three of these games and have a chance to win? Well, it's important at this point in the season, at this point of where we're at in the standings, it's important to win all games ever. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I think it's just going to be massively important to pull out, I'm going to say at least two, maybe get, um, maybe another overtime loss squeezes its way in there. I hope not. I hope not too, uh, but if it, if there is anything to fall back on, let's say we win two and we take in another overtime loss, you were at least looking at points in your last handful. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can you can take out the fact that they're overtime losses and say to yourself, well, at least, um, which was that last? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. At least it's points in the last seven. Yeah. If we head into the break and say we gained standings points in seven straight, it is at least sounding a hell of a lot better than four, four, and two in our last ten. Yeah. So yeah, it does. You know what else would sound better than that though? Five oh and two in your last seven going into the all-star break. There it is. And you're absolutely right about that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see what happens with that. But we will be back on Thursday with a full episode of the Tip of the Iceberg podcast. In the meantime, make sure you check out the feed for many episodes called Penguins to Go that come out usually Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays when I don't forget that I'm driving five hours in the morning. But that's going to do it for this episode of the Tip of the Iceberg podcast. We will see you guys next time. Have a great week, Penguins fans.